Hi friends, great to be joining you. It's crazy, like it's absolutely crazy that another week has passed. Thank you so much for joining me on another blog. I I just bless you in Jesus' name. I thank you and I give a big shout out to the friends in England that have been in contact with us. We love you and we bless you in the mighty name of Jesus. I've entitled this little blog this week, Tears, Tragedies and Triumphs. Now that's taken me back to my gospel holidays and having three different key points, all beginning with the same letter. So forgive me for that. But I I just want to break it up into that. Tears, Tragedies and Triumphs. And so I want to say right at the outset, listen, right at the outset of this, you know what this is about. And this is about ultimately sharing about the goodness of God and about the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, how the Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And just to put you out of any doubt, if you think you're not a sinner, let me tell you what the word of God says. For all have sinned and fallen short of God's standard. So that is an incorporating term that incorporates the whole world. For all have sinned. And have fallen short of God's standard. That means that you watching this. Me that's recording it. We were all born in sin. And shaped in iniquity. And the Bible says in sin did our mothers conceive us. So this is all about sharing the love of Christ. To tell you that there's hope in Jesus Christ. And that Jesus Christ can be your saviour. He can be your Lord. He can be your master. He can be your healer. He can be your great physician. He can be everything to you because that is what Jesus Christ is. So this has been a big day. I want to thank you. Those of you that have remembered to pray, it's Friday the 12th of February and some of you got in touch with me and I thank you for that and said that you were praying for Heather and I this morning. We had our first meeting, our first meeting together since I got my kidney removed on the 18th of November and this was our first meeting together with the two cancer specialists, the surgeons that were involved in my surgery and we sat with them today and so we want to be honest that's what this is all about and this is why I have entitled the first little thing tears. It wasn't the news that Heather and I had hoped for today and I want to be completely honest to all of those of you that are suffering with cancer those of you that are, that are caring for people with cancer, you know that cancer is graded between grade one to grade four. Grade one being they catch it early and it's a low grade of cancer and they'd be confident in that. And grade four being the high risk, the one that is more vigorous, the one that is more aggressive. Sadly, Heather and I were told today that I have grade four aggressive cancer. They were straight with us as they've always been and I will receive a full body scan on March the 12th of this year and I would appreciate you to pray into that but we now are very well aware that this cancer is aggressive cancer. They didn't pull any punches today and so as Heather and I left that meeting this morning and this is where we want to be honest, yes we have got hope in Jesus Christ. Yes, 100%. Now listen to me, 100%. We believe God could heal me in a moment, but I want to put something out here right now because I'm not in the camp. I am not in the camp that believes that God heals everyone. Now now I want to stress that. And I've had many messages where people question my, my methods and my motives thinking, oh, you've give up, you're defeatist. You don't believe that God could heal you. Let me say this, God could heal me in a moment, in a moment. But I want to stress that God does not heal everybody. I have buried people that prayed for healing. I remember attending the funeral of someone who believed they'd got a word from someone that said, look, you shall not die and live and declare the goodness of God. They died because it was not God's will to heal them. And there was many things that happened as a result of their death where God was glorified. Yes, for the family, there was pain. Yes, for the people left behind, there was great tears and great sadness. But God ultimately was glorified. So I want to say to you right now, I am believing God for healing. I am not giving up on that. 
But I am also wise enough and understand enough of scripture to know this. That God did not heal everybody in scripture. And when Jesus Christ healed people, it was to show miraculous signs of who he was. The son of the living God. And I 100% believe today and have observed today that God is still in the healing business. But God also takes people through sickness and tragedy and yes, even death to reveal his glory and to ultimately speak, speak to other people that don't know Jesus Christ. And he gets all the glory because Colossians 1, 18 says this, in all things, he must have the preeminence. And so I say to you right now, you continue to pray. It's this aggressive cancer. And so with that in mind, I want to say right at the outset before I bring you to some tragedies and triumphs, finish with triumphs. I want to finish on a high note. This is my last little blog for a few weeks because for the next few weeks, Heather and I have made a conscious decision. As we left today, the two cancer surgeons, we drove across from Limavady Row Valley Hospital where we met them and we went to Benone Beach and we shed loads of tears, loads of tears. As we thought of what we were just told, as we thought of the diagnosis and we decided there and then that this will be the last blog for a while. But hold on, I want to share something with you later on. This is going to be my last blog for a while until I get the scan on March the 12th because we want to focus on our boys and Heather and I want to focus on each other. And ultimately, and my wife said this and I pass it on to you. Ultimately, we want to focus upon our God in this current situation. So please hang in there. Don't unsubscribe. If you haven't subscribed, please hit the subscribe button because you're going to be interested in what we plan for this little channel in the time that God avails to us in the coming weeks, months in his will. So tears, plenty of tears this morning as we sat in Bonone Beach, as we drove through downhill in Castle Rock. We held each other's hands, we prayed together and we cried together and we committed what the doctors had just told us into the hands of the great physician. Remember, he's the great physician, the God, the all-knowing God, the omnipotent, omniscient, omniscient, omnipresent God, the God that can absolutely do anything above all that we ever could even ask for or even think about. He's a great God. So tears, plenty of them tragedies. Let me bring you back. I'm lying in Alton Gelvin Hospital. Here I am and I'm lying there and I'm talking to God and there's complications have set in. I'm on the pick line. I'm absolutely ravenous with hunger. But then news was going to come to me that three folk that I had been praying with had all died. And folks, that spoke to me. Because Hebrews 9, 27 says this, death is something that we don't want to think about. Death is something that we want to run away from. And we want to, to, to put it away at the back of our minds. We know we're going to die, but just not yet. Well, can I tell you, three folk died in my time in hospital on our ward. I had prayed with them. And there was great tragedy. And some of them were actually a little family that were from a Baptist background whose sister was in the hospital just literally round the corner from my room. They died. That brought great tragedy to a lot of folk in the ward. As we've seen the beds with the blue, if you've ever been there and seen it, they put that big blue cover all over the bed as the people from their mortuary come and wheel you away. And it brought great tragedy to our wee ward on those three different occasions as three folk died. Folks, the Bible says in Hebrews 9, 27, it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this judgment. And if you're not a believer, if you don't know Jesus Christ, and if you're suffering right now with cancer and the pains of cancer and tumours and sickness and nausea, if you think, and I've heard some cancer patients saying this on our ward, that they were going through hell on earth. Can I tell you with love in my heart, what you experience, painful and all as it is, with your tumour and your cancer, it's not hell. Because hell's a real place, and I'm going to refer to it, but God showed me one night as I lay in my hospital room. And so the tragedies came to our ward. Death of three people that we were praying for. 
I was glad to know of two of them that had trusted Jesus Christ. And I was confident in the fact that for them, it wasn't a lost eternity. It was absent from the body and present with the Lord. And we all have that wonderful, wonderful joy. I remember praying with that wee family, the wee Baptist family in the corridor outside Ward 31. And I said to them, with sorrow not as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again, even so them which died in Christ, God will bring with him. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And I just want to shout out, I want to shout out to those of you that, is, that have buried loved ones. Jesus Christ is going to raise them first. They're not going to miss out. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. But get this, so shall we ever be with the Lord. At that moment, when the graves opened and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Isn't it wonderful to have hope in Jesus Christ? And so the tears, Heather and I, plenty of them today. Plenty of them. The tragedy, hospital. But then there was something else that was going to speak to me in this hospital. I'm, I'm lying. And the surgeon comes to see me and he says, uh, how are you getting on with your, your feeding tube? I says, Mr. Mulholland, I'm absolutely ravenous with hunger. At this stage, I'm down to 11 stone, 11 stone from 14 stone to I am now 11 stone. And Heller's always amazed at these old cameras and videos because people have gotten in touch with me and says, boys, you look well, you haven't lost much weight. So I don't know, the cameras must add on loads. I'm 11 stone, a little bit more than three now. But that's what it was, 11 stone three. And I says, I'm struggling with a pick line, Mr. Mulholland. I understand that I have to be on it. I'm in three and a half weeks now with no food. No food, just fed through the pick line in my arm that goes down just into the, the vein above your heart and feeds you nutrients. People that have cancer know about this. Mr. Mulholland says, right. And then his understudy, Dr. Abigail, a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful friend in hospital to me. Dr. Abigail met Heather and I in the foyer of Alton Gelvin Hospital, just at the new coffee shop there. And she came in and she says, oh, I hate coming to you for, she says, I'm always the bearer of bad news. But she says, Mr. Mulholland doesn't want you to be taking any wee bits of fluid through your mouth anymore. I've been taking wee sips of water just for comfort, just for comfort, not drinking loads, but that's a comfort. And so folks, I'm just going to grab something. Stay with me, stay with me. So folks, I was told that I wasn't allowed even water now. They brought me round this wee tray. And in the wee tray was a load of these wee sponges. And they said, Mark, you can use these just to, just to chew on, just to dampen your mouth. Folks, I started to do that in my ward, little room on my own. And I dipped it into the water and put it on this. Then one night I really, really, really got a strong sense of pictures of faces and people that I love and people that I know. And family members, aunts and uncles, cousins, friends that still don't know Jesus Christ and still think that we're just religious goofs and Bible bashers. And I'm sitting in my wee room and I'm taking these. And I'm damping my mouth and I am so thirsty. I cannot describe to you. I cannot describe to you the thirst that I have. And I'm just damping my mouth. Then God started to give me these pictures of all the friends, family and relations. God says, Mark, he spoke clearly to me. He says, Mark, what's it going to be like for all of these people that you're seeing in your mind right now if they die without Christ? And find themselves in a lost eternity. Mark, what does my Bible, my word say? What does the scripture say about that awful place called hell? And I started to read Luke 16. And if you've never read this, you go grab your Bible right now. Or you look it up on your, your device. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen. And he fared sumptuously. In other words, he ate the best every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus that laid his gate. And he just fell, fed himself from the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. But when you hear what it says, the rich man died. 
and the beggar died. And it says that Lazarus was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom, but the rich man also died and was buried. But get this, get this, if you're not saved, get this. It says, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and seeing Abraham afar off, and Lazarus, the old beggar, Lazarus that was lying, getting the crumbs, Lazarus in his bosom, and he says this, he says, send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And as I lay there with my wee sponge, just dipping water, for all there was in this so parched, so thirsty, I thought of all the folk that will die without Jesus Christ and find themselves in the lake of fire. Now let me show you folks. I don't know if you can see this. There's a drop just fell off my finger. The folk that have heard the gospel. Folk brought up in a Christian home. Folk that got a gospel tract. Folk that heard a preacher. And then they said to themselves on the streets. Boys he need to shut his mouth. I'm fed up listening to them boys. Imagine to find yourselves in the lake of fire. The first thing you ask for. Is a drop. Of water to cool your tongue because you're tormented in this flame cancer patients those of you that are suffering with any sort of illness that are not saved and think that you are going through hell listen can I can I can I speak so so lovingly what you and I are going through right now is a teddy bear's picnic compared to what you will go through if you find yourself in a Christless eternity but here's what the story says in Luke 16. The word comes back. Son, remember. Do you get it? Number one, you're going to feel in the lake of fire. You're going to feel. You're going to have your senses. This man finds himself there and he's looking for a drop of water to cool his tongue. But then he gets word back. Son, remember. His mind is still working. Imagine to find yourself. In the lost eternity. And I'm not just talking about being there for a year. Or ten. Or a hundred. Boys if you were there for a hundred. And you knew you were getting out. At least you knew you were getting out. But folks if you die without Jesus Christ. You're going to be there forever. And you're not getting out. And your mind's going to be going. You're going to remember the gospel meetings. You're going to remember the gospel tracks. You're going to remember Mark Taylor sitting pleading with you. Pleading with you. Pleading with you to come to Jesus. You're going to remember it all. And you know what this man thinks about? He thinks about his five brothers. And you know if you find yourself in a hard place, the first thing you want is your family around you to comfort you. Isn't that right? But when you hear what he says, find himself in this awful place called hell. He says, look, there's five brothers. Will you tell someone to go and tell them not to come here? Because it's awful. He doesn't want his family there. And he pleads for someone to go and tell his family. Not to come. Let me take you back to the hospital. I want to come to this final part now of triumph. Triumph. At a 20 past one, I was sleeping. My, my curtains pulled. I always pulled my curtains when I was in the open ward. Now, that was the ward where there was four patients. I always pulled my curtains at night because during the night, there was generally one of us that were vomiting or sick or something and then there was a whole big commotion and lights and all on. So if you pulled your curtains, at least you could get a wee bit of kip. But my curtains pulled back and in came a beautiful doctor. He's watching this and I said I wouldn't mention his name. So I'm not going to. But as soon as he came in through those curtains, I, I saw Jesus Christ shining out of him. He sat beside my bed. And we talked for a while and then I just stopped him and I says, can I ask you something? You're saved, aren't you? You know Jesus Christ, don't you? He says, how did you know? I says, I saw Jesus shining out of you. He was the first of three doctors that I was going to befriend. The other two are two female doctors. They're watching this too. One of them came to my room when I got bad news. One of them came and prayed with me. And them doctors have started the prayer meeting. In Alton and Alton and it's still going every Wednesday morning before their eight o'clock shift. What a triumph!
to know that God is working in Altnagelvin Hospital and them doctors are meeting to pray for the patients and to pray that God would not just heal them physically, but God would heal them spiritually and bring them salvation. Isn't that a triumph? That you have doctors that are praying for you. And I'm sitting in the movie room and it's the middle of the week. It's about roughly about 20 past eight at night. There's a boy got up and down my room. I've made room door open. He's gone up and down. He's gone up and down. And he's looking in and he's looking in and he's looking in. And then all of a sudden I stop and I says, sir, do you want to come in? He says, you don't mind. He says, I want to ask you what you're reading. He says, is that the Bible? I says, it's the Bible. I says, it's the only thing that has got me through this journey so far is the God of this book. He welled up with tears. He says, can I come in and close the door? He was dumb as celery. He yeah, says, you can. I'll never forget it. He came in, closed the door and he sat in the sink. You know, he sink in my room. He says, on Friday, he says, I fell on my knees in the flat in my little room in Derry here. And he says, I cried to God. And I says, God, if you're real, will you send a Christian across my path to point me to Jesus Christ? And he says, I cannot believe that he's pointed me to someone in hospital to point me to Jesus. And me and him sat in that room. We prayed together and he trusted Jesus Christ. What a triumph to see a man brought out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, into the kingdom of God's dear son. I'm emotional tonight, folks, because I feel this. I've felt this message all week. Before I got any news today, I knew I got the news on Monday. Heather only got it today. She only came with me today. I got the news on Monday of this week. So I'm not crying because of the news. I'm crying because I love you. And I want to see you saved. And I want to tell you right now, some of you know me. Some of you might think, look at this video, boy, you're somebody to be telling people to come to Jesus Christ with the past you've got. Listen, I know about my past, but when I tell you something, God says my past is blotted out. My past has been confessed and exposed. And you need to do that with your past to get it blotted out, to get it forgiven. So triumph. God was saving. Let me tell you, there's two more nurses. And I don't want to speak too long on this, but they've got in touch with us this week. And they've made commitment to Jesus Christ too last week as well. Isn't that powerful? Isn't that powerful? What triumph. And I was excited and rejoicing here. But you know what the Bible says? When people trust Christ, the angels throw a party in heaven over another sinner. Trust in Jesus and come into repentance. I'm finished. I don't know how long this is. But let me tell you what we're thinking. I want you to subscribe and share this right now. Please, will you share this? The triumph of this story is this. On the Friday, Mr. Mulholland comes and sees me. Heather's down with me. This is where we're finishing this part of the journey. Heather's down with me on the Friday. Mr. Mulholland comes and he says to me, Mark, how would you like to eat something? <laughs> Folks, I know in the Bible they went 40 days fast and I know all that and not as many, but that's truly supernatural. I know three and a half weeks in without a bite going into this man's mouth on a feeding tube. And Mr. Mulholland comes on the Friday and he says, no, I don't want you to go mad at the thing. But he says, how would you like to eat tonight? We're going to take out the feeding line in a couple of days time. But he says you can start eating the night. And folks that night. That Friday night. Heather gave me two McVitie's digestive biscuits. And a cup of tea. And boy. It was like manna to a hungry soul. It was amazing. And I ate on the Friday night. He says I'm allowing you to eat. Because I've decided I'm going to take you. I think you're fit enough now. He says, I'm going to take you for major surgery on Monday, the 11th of January. I'm going to open you right down the middle. He says, I have to take out your bowel. And he says, I have to really go in. And he says, it's big surgery, but he says, I'm allowing you to eat. He says, just for a bit of comfort for yourself and a bit of enjoyment for the next few days. And I had another triumphal night because I ate two McVitie's digestive biscuits and I drank a cup of tea. And then I had a chicken, chicken fillet that the nurse bought me brought me and a bit of boiled rice and it was tremendous folks it was tremendous now Heather leaves she says darling I'll come down on Sunday which was the 10th of January the day before the surgery I'll come down on Sunday 
and she says, my beard had grew right wee bit at this stage. She says, I'll shave that old beard and I'll trim your finger, your 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 nails and your fingers for the neat cut. Imagine, she's me spoiled rotten. Hi, she is me spoiled rotten. And she come down in the sun now, and she done exactly that. And then I walked her to the door because I got a call to say that they wanted me back to do an ECG in my heart because the surgeon wanted it before surgery. And I went back to my room to do the ECG. I'm lying with the ECG things all on me and my phone goes and it's a text message from my wife and it says the following words. Mark, don't ring me darling. I have fallen outside and I'm on my way to a and &E. Of course, the first thing I did was ring her in FaceTime. And I rang Heather on FaceTime. I was just literally leaving her at the door of Alt McElvin and back in my room on the ECG machine. And I rang her and there she was on FaceTime with the tears streaming down her face, lying on a hospital bed. And we, Heather, had a double break. She slipped an ice on the steps, got out of Alt McElvin on the Sunday before my surgery and ended up in a wheelchair. Thank God today she's in the air boots, if you know what they are. She's still in a lot of pain, folks. And I would love you to pray for her as well. And I finish this blog right now by thanking you. Those of you that have been praying for us. Those of you that have given meals to us. Those of you that have given financially to help us in these days. You have no idea what it has meant to us. But ultimately, I want to give thanks to my Lord and Saviour. Because he measured. And he has brought me through this far. And he has still got the measuring rod in his hand and he'll still bring us through. Folks, the plan for this wee blog, I've got in touch with some other cancer patients and some other very sick patients, very sick patients, that Jesus has touched with salvation or Jesus has blessed them and, and brought them through. And so God will, and if you subscribe, you're going to hear not just Heather and I's journey, but you're going to hear some blogs from other people that are going to join me as I share with them on this wee channel as they tell you what Jesus Christ means to them. In the meantime, listen, I'm not going to be on for a few weeks, so you'll not expect any. Please subscribe, because we'll tell you the results of the scan on March the 12th. We will tell you what's going to happen with oncology, and then we will start with our first little person that is going to share with us. Her name is Joanne Peden. She has written three books. She's going to share her story. She's been bedridden for years. Some of you might know her. And we love her. She's been a blessing to us. She's been bedridden. She's only a young lady, but she's going to share in the first journey. So please, will you subscribe? There's not going to be, you're not going to be bombarded with videos, folks. And you're not going to be bombarded or be supporting Mark Taylor or anything like that. It's not about that. This is to share this channel with others that need to hear about Christ. So hit the subscribe button. Come on, hit the subscribe button right now. Go on to Facebook, go on to whatever. Share this video with as many people as you can. And I will see you all again in the near future as I finish. Sharon Morrison, what a blessing to our hearts. Sharon didn't even know this, but she's been such a blessing. Sharon is a powerful singer, sings with the Morrisons. Some of you might know her, her, her daughter, Nikki, and I think it's Daryl. I'm near sure it's Daryl and Vibe in Armagh. They run that little church, and boy, that's a blessing to so many folk. But Sharon has agreed to sing this song at the end of this video. And it's a song that's precious to us. Because I want to share something with those of you that go and maybe visit people that are sick and dying or very ill. It's okay to go and visit them and encourage them. But sometimes you can come and you can deliver this whole big sermon and loads of verses. Let me tell you something what Pastor Willie Mullen once said. It's all right for you coming, doing that when you're standing at the end of the bed. Just you try being in the bed. And it's a different story, folks. So please... Always make sure that you don't say that you know how people feel if you don't know how they feel. Always make sure that what verse of scripture you want to share is from God. And listen, remember this, what Sharon's about to sing right now. The God of the mountain is still God in the valley. Listen to Sharon as she sings this song right now. Join Sharon on a Monday evening live on Sharon Morrison Facebook page. She is live from 8 o'clock. It'll be a blessing to your soul as Sharon sings some old pieces, some new pieces, and sometimes she allows David, her husband, to join her. Boys, she's got him under the thumb, mind you, but don't you tell her I said that. He is under the thumb, that critter. Pray for him. Sharon Morrison will love you. David will love you. In the mighty name of Jesus, be blessed, folks. 
Contact me. You can still contact me. 07543 926 730. 07543 926 730. Send me a wee message, a wee text, and I'll do my best to reply where possible. Or email me, Mark Taylor, M A R C Taylor, T A Y L O R 338 at gmail.com. Please keep in touch with me. See you in a few weeks' time, folks. Subscribe. Sure. But ultimately, find Jesus. God bless you. Amen. Thank you. Body.